um, I had just become a believer and I had a girl that had been my girlfriend before I got saved and we were trying to figure out how that was going to work and it didn't work. But um, I was trying to explain the gospel to her and she said, so you mean you can just sin all you want then? And I was a brand new believer. And honestly, I didn't have, I didn't know, I didn't have the words because I'm like, yeah, well, you, yeah, well, I guess you shouldn't, I, I didn't know what to say, right? I just, I was stumped. So you can just sin all you want and still go to heaven. Now, technically, a good Calvinist would say yes, <laughs> right? But we all know there's a big, giant catch and a caveat to that, right? Well, fast forward to about three months ago, this woman, and I have to tell you, from another church, um, she's kind of notorious, but whatever, she wanted to meet with me. And he, even Rick said, why did you say yes? But I did. And this is what she said. She said, I'm deeply concerned. I go, why is that? She goes, there's people in the church. Now, she didn't specifically say KCF, but I think that's where she was headed, right? There are people in the church who are having sex and they're not married. And nobody's telling them that they're going to hell. <laughs> Well, thankfully, that wasn't me 28 years ago, because I have answers now. And I said, first of all, no. <laughs> People aren't going to hell because they're having sex outside of marriage. And then I had to instruct her about grace and salvation and da-da-da, this and that. But I was grateful that I have some depth now, some scriptural chutzpah. Is that a, is somebody, is that a swear word? Yes. No. <laughs> Boldness, okay. So tonight, I'm going to tell you this. The reason why I bring this up, tonight we have verses that are a legalist's dream. If someone wants to like catch you in sin and be like, oh, you might not even be saved. Oh, they would love these verses tonight. But my point is we have ballast. We have depth. We know the grace of God and we know the whole and complete gospel. And because of what we reviewed three weeks ago, we also know the context of why John was telling them not to sin. And the reason why is because they had come under the heavy influence of the Gnostics who were teaching two things. Either A, they did not sin, even when they were doing all, all kinds of sinful behaviors. And then they denied even the concept of sin. And if it was even real, that the material body, the material body didn't count and therefore you could do whatever you wanted. Now you can imagine what an incredible temptation that was for believers who are trying, especially pagan converts, pagan converts who have lived this lifestyle their whole lives and are now trying to abstain from said behaviors. And people are going to them and go, oh man, those guys got it wrong. They're stupid. We are the Gnostics. We are enlightened. We are the enlightened. What does that sound familiar? Like to um, the past? When, when was the enlightenment? Uh, 1700s, 1800s? Yeah. The enlightenment kind of went down that same path, actually. Yeah. Pretty much sort of destroyed the church a bit. Yeah. Anyways. Okay. That's what I'm going to use for my, um, my um, review tonight because we're running. I'm running out of time. I've talked too much and we sang too long, but whatever. Okay. So um, it's hard to imagine any other book in the Bible where the context of the instructions is so vitally important. And that is the fact that John is writing to the jerk, the church, to the jerks. <laughs> you caught that. I tried, I tried to pretend I didn't say that. You wouldn't let it go. <laughs> yes. He's writing to the church. Um, he's writing to the church who are coming under the influence of these Gnostics. And so John is going to go on a, I think I pronounced this right, diatribe, okay, um, a rant, I put there in case I couldn't remember how to pronounce it, against this crazy, dangerous teaching of the Gnostics who either deny that they sin or believe that sin doesn't count, so go ahead and sin like crazy. So we pick up the story, actually the last two verses from last week, chapter 2, verse 28, it's the, it's the um, it actually is the intro for tonight. And now, dear children, continue, there's that word again. Continue, remain, menos, remember? In him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Um, I have in my notes to read the NIV notes, so I'm going to read this. 
The visible proof of being a Christian is right behavior. Now, many people do good deeds but don't have faith in Jesus Christ. Others claim to have faith but rarely produce good deeds. A deficit in either faith or right behavior will, cause, will be cause for shame when Christ returns because the faith always results, because true faith always results in good deeds, <laughs> which is basically a one sentence summary of the entire book of James, right there, right? Uh, okay. Um, those who claim to have faith and consistently, there's that word, continuation, remain, whatever, and it's going to come up a bunch again tonight, um, do what is right are true believers. Good deeds cannot produce salvation, that's key, um, but they are necessary proof that true faith is actually present. And by the way, that's exactly what the book of James teaches, yeah? True faith produces fruit, and the fruit is good deeds. In fact, um, that was what uh, John the Baptist, by the way, was yelling uh, at the religious leaders right before Jesus shows up. He says this, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. The natural outflow of faith and repentance is fruit and good deeds, okay? Um, and by the way, what John the Baptist was harping on the religious leaders is they were praising God with their lips, but he says, your hearts are far from him. Yeah, their hearts are so, you know, you know, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, and then uh, varm out or whatever. Okay, so chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. What a great concept. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Well, this isn't a new concept for us tonight. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because we got about 50 concepts to go through tonight. But this idea that God is our father. I mean, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, what do we say? Our Father. Okay, now just so you know, um, at least one small part of the teaching is this sort of intimate prayer was unknown to the Jews prior to Jesus. They very much likely blew their minds when he referred to Father with what Hebrew word? Abba. Abba. Which, by the way, check that. It might be Aramaic. Check that. It might be Aramaic. I don't remember. You think it's Aramaic? Remember, I did a teaching on it Fairly recently, one thing that's interesting about it is it doesn't necessarily just mean father. It is in the extremely familiar sense like daddy, like daddy. And that kind of intimate relationship with God the Father was sort of unknown um, to the Israelites. Uh, MacArthur said this, such love is inexplicable in human terms. It is not surprising then that the world does not know the nature of of the relationship between God and his children. So the world doesn't quite understand this deep-seated relationship, father to a child, that we enjoy. By the way, um, Kyler, you know, our junior high youth pastor, I was having a great conversation with him the other day, and he's holding his kid. And he says, and, and who among us, if you were a Christian when you had kids, who among us? would not agree with this statement. He goes, you know, Dave, having your own baby has taught me so much about God and how he loves me. Isn't that the truth? I mean, do you remember holding a baby and going, I get it, Lord, I get it. And then all the way through, toddler world and even teenager world, I get it, Lord, right? You know, like, I get it, yeah? By the way, he says, I like it, he says this, he says, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we'll be like him. Reminds me of another great sermon I heard real recently about planting a seed. <laughs> Being facetious, my sermon on Sunday. But it's true. And I'll reiterate it for those of you that weren't here on Sunday morning. But, you know, when you plant an avocado seed, you come back 25 years later, you don't have a 50-foot tall avocado seed, right? The seed doesn't remotely resemble what you get, the fruit-bearing thing that you get. And that is our understanding of what happens after death. Um, also, you do the math. If, if we don't know what we'll be like, 
um, but we will be like him, it's, it assumes that we don't fully understand him even now. And I would agree with that. Like, I feel like my life has been a, you know, the last 30 odd years has been getting to know him more. Does that make sense? Like, I don't, at actually, I wouldn't say, um, I fully know Jesus fully, right? You know, I think he knows me fully, but I think my understanding of him continues to grow, which is, you know, Romans 12 too. Uh, the punchline, of course, is, is if you do know him, well, words like obedience and righteousness and purity become more important. When you come to know the Lord, you start looking at your life differently. Um, MacArthur again says this, um, rather than be consumed with, quote, what will heaven be like? <laughs> Believers should be consumed with conforming to his life, to living out the Christ-like life now, and we'll worry about what heaven's like when we get there. I thought that was pretty good, yeah. Okay, um, and then we're gonna get back to that word, remain, remain, remain. Okay, so uh, verses four to six. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that we might, that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues, there it is again, to sin has either seen him or known him. Now again, it's pretty simple logic. In Jesus, there is no sin. When we are fully in him, we're not sinning. Now, remember from Sunday, we had the overlapping circles, right? When we are fully living in the eternal life, when we are fully listening to our inner man, our inner woman, when we are being obedient, we are fully in him, we are fully alive, and we're not in sin. The problem is we don't necessarily live like that all the time because we're learning. And like I said on Sunday, Hopefully that eternal part of us is growing, right? Okay. Um, now, by the way, rather than questioning your salvation because you still sin, right? Because you all still sin, right? I put in my notes here, see Paul's notes on Romans chapter 7, right? I don't do the things I do want to do, and I do the things I don't want to do. Who will save me from this wretched body of death, right? So rather than read these verses and sort of question my salvation, because that's not what he's talking about here, remember the context here for what it is. The Gnostics, or the so-called enlightened people around you, claim that they know, that they have deep knowledge, but they continue unabashedly to sin. What he's saying is here, they obviously don't know the Lord. Do you understand the difference? They claim to know but they don't know the Lord because no true, you know, what did my pastor in Jay Bay used to say? No true bathed in the blood, baptized, Bible-believing believer, they all started with B's, right? Is gonna tell you, oh, you can sin. It's no big deal. By the way, that reminds me, I've heard some horrific stories uh, meeting with women on occasion about meeting guys through Christian dating sites who after a date will say something like, well, come on, let's go to my place. And they're like, hey, I thought you were a Christian and we gotta wait, you have to save it till you're married. And had Christian guys say, well, let's pretend we're married tonight. <laughs> How slimy is that, yeah? Claiming to know, right? But don't actually know him. Um, I would underline if I were you, no one who continues to sin. The tense on this is like, you know, blatant and continuous and ongoing sinful behavior. The guy, so, what's it? The guy identified as married. Yeah, the guy, yeah, yeah, I, identi I identify as married to you. Oh, yeah, exactly. And that's a great example of like this so called enlightened thinking that I can call what is evil good and it becomes good because I decide it is. These are not people that have a deep, uh, a deep, communion with Christ. So MacArthur says this, John is not referring to occasional acts of sin. That's why I would underline that word continues, but to established and continual patterns of sinful behavior. Believers will sometimes sin even willfully, but they will not and cannot sin habitually, persistently, and as a way of life. And I, I, would, I would agree with that. 
it's a little rough when you're a Calvinist because we don't want to ever judge anybody else's life based on their external behavior. But with that said, I am on board with the concept that I just read to you. Does that make sense? Yeah? Far be it for me to see a backslidden brother and question his salvation. Far be it for me to question his salvation. But it doesn't mean I don't agree with the concept that true believers are, are, are not persistently, um, and what did he say? Um, yeah, habitually, yeah. And I like, I like that word, okay? And then um, let's keep going and I'll finish this next little section and then we'll pause for questions and things. Verses seven to eight. Now, see, this is so key, this sentence right here. Underline this sentence if you're taking notes or you're a highlighter type of person. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. You see why he's writing this letter. And the, remember the historical context. These people are being led astray, okay? He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Wow. <laughs> okay. To, peep, to a people that are clearly close to John's heart. This is Remember, this is the town of Ephesus. This is the church at Ephesus he's writing to. He issues one of the clearest warnings that eliminates who he is talking about and what the situation is. Don't be led astray is exactly what's been happening. And by the way, look at the tension and what I wrote in my notes, the, the juxtaposition between the words led astray and remain and abide right? He's been saying, remain. The Greek word is menos. And I should try to count it up how many times he said that word in the last three chapters. Remain, remain, remain. Abide, abide, abide. Continue, continue, continue. And now he uses this do not be led astray, which is the polar opposite of remaining in, right? And he says, remain with what you knew in the beginning, now, that's interesting because how long has Paul been dead at this point? 25 years. Paul founded the church in Ephesus. So this is a church that's 25 years old. And he keeps referring, as you heard in the beginning, because what they heard in the beginning was the gospel of grace, salvation through the blood of Christ, and now bear fruit going with repentance, right? But now they're being led astray from that root. Does that make sense? Am I belaboring the point? I'll continue. Okay, let's talk qu quickly about the devil. Um, the Greek word, anybody? Diabolos. <laughs> yeah, diabolos, right? Uh, or it also means adversary, the one who comes against, right? The adversary. Uh, I want to read, I've been reading a lot of MacArthur too. I want to read from Glenn Barker. He's the other um, guy that I've really been doing a deep dive in reading. This is what he said. It's kind of a long quote, but bear with me. There is clearly a progression in the author's thoughts on sin. Um, he begins with sinfulness is rebellion against God. Next, he shows that it's, in, it's incompatibility with Christ, he who was without sin. Then he shows its incompatibility for anyone who lives in Christ because no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Now he shows the diabolic, well, well chosen word, right? The diabolic nature of sin. Its source is the devil who has been sinning from when? The beginning. Look at, look, uh, he's doing, John's such a smart author, yeah? The way, he's, the way he's manipulating the concepts and the terminology to take you back to what you know and even go back to Adam and Eve in the garden where it began, Yeah. And John is kind of, these are my thoughts, he's revealing the insanity of it. Like, think about this. Satan teps Adam and Eve guys into sinning thousands of years ago, earlier than, than John's writing this letter. And everybody knows it's what ruined everything. And then, you know, just insert, I'm joking going to say this, insert the entire Old Testament, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's not some small thing. Right? Abraham, Moses, and you know, David, the prophets, all that. And then finally, after what, 18, 1800 years, 2000 years, Christ comes. And what does he do? He reverses the curse 
from the garden. He sets us free from the curse that we now might inhabit eternity in our, our, our etern- I should say Christ can inhabit our hearts and therefore eternity can be in our hearts. We can live in Christ and, and live out a righteous life. And now these knuckleheads are coming along telling you, you don't need to. And, and they're completely dismissing the entire plan of God going all the way back to the time of Adam. And who is John saying is responsible for it? The devil. He hadn't stopped. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that great? And I, I wrote, I underlined and made an exclamation like, it's the reason Jesus came. <laughs> and John's saying, don't go there, okay? Uh, let me read two more verses and then we'll stop. Uh, verse nine. Uh, Therefore, where is my verse nine? Therefore, no one who is born of God will, there it is again, continue to inhabit, right? Sin, because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. Let's just keep going. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother, okay? So it's just a, another juxtaposition between continue and remain and don't be led astray. Uh, the Greek for uh, continue is an action word. Um, well, actually, notice what he does here. Sorry, the word here, continue, the juxtaposition he's doing here is don't continue in sin, right? But remain in Christ. So there are two different words. To continue in sin is a Greek word, poio. And it's an action word, action word. It also translates like to exercise, to execute, committing, carrying on, accomplishing, and producing. Practice. But it, what's that? And practicing, right? Yeah, don't practice these things that lead to death. He says instead, remain, abide. And you know the word that popped into my head yesterday when I was putting this together was anchor yourself. Yeah. <laughs> right? Anchor. Stephanie's not. Welcome home, Stephanie. We missed you. We'd like to hear maybe sometime your um, Chevy Chase's RV vacation story, yeah? Did you really blow out six tires? Just one? All right. All six tires. Oh, wow. Six-tire RV. Anyways, have you guys read the new newsletter that just came out this week? I thought Rick did a great job of describing and explaining why the name of the Bible school is anchor house, right? And the reason I bring it up is remember, don't continue in sin, but remain, abide, an anchor. And what Rick says in this article is, is our society is drifting from Judeo-Christianity and leaving behind what used to be considered sin, right? I mean, you know, and, and now rejoicing in this sin. The Bible is an anchor, to God and God's righteousness, right? And that's what the anchor house is to do, is to provide that foundation and that anchor that kids can remain, menos, remain in Christ. It's almost like Ephesus all over again. Do you see the similarity? Oh, we're more enlightened now. Back then, you Puritans, right? And God's like, God's word's like, no, no, we remain. Okay. Uh, and this is how we'll know. Um, by the way, this first 10 is almost worth skipping because appara- I don't understand. Let me, if I read it, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not. Blah, blah, blah. Apparently, the Greek in that particular verse is super confusing. So um, um, most co- commentators were like, well, you know, um, this is like, that's, this is how we know Any, anyone who does not do what is right is not a, a child of God. And then, of course, he just ends this section with love your brother, which sets up the next section. Sorry to end with kind of a confusing thing there, but I was sort of intrigued that all the commentators are like, this is a really weird sentence to translate. Nobody's exactly sure maybe what it means. Okay, you guys have any questions or comments? Okay, I'm going to repeat that for the camera real quick. Tom says he heard a great lecture today regarding the first verse of the book, what kind of love, um, because the Gnostics' definition of love 
was uh, changeable and whatever versus the immutable, unchanging love of God that does not change. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. Yeah. Anybody else? Habits, I'm going to repeat that for the camera. Habits can be changed. Yeah, amen. In fact, you know, I know I've brought this up before and I always refer back to Romans 12, um, you know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I think I said this a few months ago, so you might remember this. But I've been hearing people tell me that read this stuff, I don't read this stuff, that apparently like the science of the brain has been showing that you quite literally can change the way you think. You develop new, what they call neuro pathways. And you, you can break habits. And gosh, stop me before I preach again, but I kind of feel like that's what happens when you continue to read the Bible. You think about things differently. Sin no longer seems like, oh, that thing that I'd like to do because it's fun, but I can't do because I'm a Christian. But you begin to see like, oh my gosh, that way of life is horrible. And it leads to death. And, and it's quite interesting because I'm of an age now, I became a Christian at 25, where I can see the guys who are the same age as me that never left that lifestyle look old and their, their lives are disasters, and some of them are dead because they never got out of that lifestyle. And you begin, and by the way, that's just one element, you know, uh, drugs, you know, but it could be all kinds of different things. Sin is just death. Anyway, so yeah, but habits can be changed, and we see it in the church. Okay, it's five after. Let's go ahead and jump into part two here. Uh, out of the blue, Cain shows up. Uh, because I think, remember, he keeps saying in the beginning. So he's been talking about Satan. And so now we're just kind of like one step out of the garden, right? He's talking about Satan in the garden. Here we go. Verse 11. This is the message you have heard from the beginning. Uh, we should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his, and his brother's we're righteous. Um, uh, Baker said this, the choice between the children of God and the children of the devil, between hatred and love, life and death, murder and self-sacrifice stems from the earliest moments of man's existence. Isn't that an interesting quote? Can I read that again? Because think about it, we're actually one step out of the garden when this happens. The choice between the children of God and the children of the devil, between hatred and love, between life and death, murder and self-sacrifice, the opposite of murder. That's interesting, self-sacrifice, yeah? Stems from the earliest moments of man's existence. Now, regarding Cain, people sometimes wonder the difference between Cain and Abel's sacrifice that is actually something worth uh, just watching the Bible projects thing on Cain and Abel. It's pretty deep. It's, there's a lot involved in what was going on between Cain and Abel. But the very short version is, is that Cain's response um, to God um, taking Abel's sacrifice and not his, which is, of course, murder, is the outward revealing of what God knew already to be within his heart. It really wasn't about whether he brought meat or vegetables, although you, some people argue that it was, but his response to his, the jealousy to his brother reveals what was in his heart before the sacrifice even happened. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, let, me, let me read to you what uh, John wrote um, in chapter 8, verse 40, 44 of the, in the Gospel of John. Uh, this is Jesus speaking. Look, look at the similarity here. As it is, this is Jesus speaking to the religious rulers. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me. <laughs> a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? You love Jesus, yeah. Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. Oof. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. Cain, right? Not holding to the truth, 
for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a, law, a liar and the father of lies. And it's interesting that just as Cain could not handle the righteousness of Abel, the religious leaders could not handle the righteousness of Christ. And they, like Cain and like Satan, murder Christ. Wow. How's John like just blowing this whole thing out? Now, this is interesting too. Verse 13, don't be surprised. And I love that. This has kind of been my mantra for the last year. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. Wow. Quite frankly, it's what they do. They have always despised righteous living Christians. Yeah. Now, forgive me because you know me, I never like to get political on Tuesday nights, but it was like the best example because it was so... It was so blatant. It was the irony of this was actually comical. So I have to say it. And that is when um, when the Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett was up for being, what do you call validated? What's the word? Confirmed. Confirmed. And the amount of hate out in front of the courthouse and they were screaming at her at the, you know, the idea of her because of the subjectation of, how is the word? Subjectation of women, the subject, subjugation. subjugation of women. Do you not see the irony of the situation? Let me explain this to you. She is a mother of seven children. <laughs> including two adopted out of Haiti and one special needs, biologically her own, of a Down syndrome, and as a mother of seven, has still managed to obtain the highest legal office, pardon me for exaggerating, but on the planet. You, the, I can't think of a greater example of the fruition of the liberation of women in my lifetime to completely excel at both being a mother and a career woman, right? But why did they hate her? Because of her faith. And the, if there, ever there was a good example of being blinded by hate, they could, I mean, they should be putting her on a pedestal as the ideal woman. But because... She's a woman of faith. They were dressed up as the hand woman's handmaid's tale, the like the women enslaved, and she is the exact example of the polar opposite. Isn't that a great? Isn't I hope you guys agree that was a good example. Yeah, it, it was just so blatant. Okay, so I don't want to talk politics, or whatever. But anyways, but let's read verses fourteen and fifteen. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. Okay, love, hate, life, death. To love is to exhibit the life of Christ. To hate is akin to death. And he says, you know, death committed is called murder. Hate is kind of a actively not loving thing. And obviously, there is no eternal life for the murderer, right? Um, because in that slice of eternity in your heart, trust me, there's no hate, right? Okay, um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, uh, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. So remember what, what Jesus does? He equates lust with adultery and he equates hatred with murder. And by the way, that, I mean, you know, I, again, I trust with this group, nobody's questioning their salvation because you've harbored hate for somebody, you've been angry with somebody, but I don't have to explain all that. But conceptually, it makes perfectly good sense. What is the polar opposite of love? It's hate. What is, and love, if love is life, what is the opposite of, of love and life, it's hate and death. And if you're causing love, you're bringing life. And if you're causing hate, you're bringing death. And I always like to say, it's not just physical death, it's emotional death, it's spiritual death, it's social death, it's relational death, it's death to joy. Joy cannot inhabit hatred, right? Okay. 
uh, and then uh, verses 16 to 18. Uh, this is how we know what love is. Oh, this is great. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can, we not, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. So that's when I was quoting from DC Talk. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you heard. Love, love, love is a verb. <laughs> yeah. It's an action, right? Now, by the way, this verse uh, from Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, Jesus said this, um, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He's talking about he, the, the prior verses to that. He says, whoever would be, um, whoever would be your, what does it he say? Whoever would be your servant must be his, whoever would be, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be his slave for even the son of man. And I love this, did not come to be served, but to serve. And then he describes what it means to serve, which is to lay down his life. Now, if I married you, did I marry anybody in this room? None of you? Oh, wow. You guys are old. Um, yeah, yeah. If I married you, I most likely read those verses at your wedding. I read it at almost every wedding I ever give as how we are to love our spouses. And my punchline I like to say is, look, in your marriage, it's not likely that God is going to ask you to go to a cross for your spouse. But there are times in your marriage when you think maybe I would rather go to a, go to a cross, right? Then what? Insert what is it in your marriage? Pick up those socks, you know, clean the rice cooker. I don't know, you know? But this is where the rubber meets the road, agape love of God in your marriage and in your life. And that is when you lay down your life. You do the thing you don't want to do. You say yes to the thing they want to do. Yeah, love is a verb. Uh, the, the commentator Baker called it costliness. To love someone and it hurts. To love someone and it costs you something to love them, yeah? And I love this, when it costs you something and you don't get anything in return. That's what, I'll get to you in a sec. That's one of my sort of points I made this year at the Compassion Sunday um, because I've had two Compassion kids and one was a wonderful, edifying, fruitful relationship that continues to, his, to this day. He just turned 29 two days ago, yeah? And, you know, we're wishing happy birthday. It was this great, you know, great. I've gone and seen him twice, right? And not so much the kid I got now. I don't get anything back, right? But that's okay. Because it's not about me, right? I, he seems to appreciate my letters that I write to him quarterly, you know? And he seems to appreciate what we've done for him. And he seems to be getting a Christian education. But I don't really get back anything from it. It's just a give. And I love that. I love that I have at least one thing in my life, right? Yeah, Luigi? So, Ravoni. Yes, you. Maybe you didn't marry us, but you're going to bury us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't hear what he said, he said, maybe you didn't marry us, but you'll bury us. <laughs> hey, man. I know it sounds funny, but it will be a privilege and an honor. And I'll tell you, you know, my pet theory on that is, man, the more the congregation is convinced of the salvation of the person they're celebrating, the more fun the memorial service is. There's usually a sense of jealousy. Oh, they got to go, man. Like, like they won, right? Right? Like, it's like, oh, they won. Yeah. And I got to tell you, I went to, I went to a funeral earlier this year. That was the polar opposite. It was all bummer and sadness and I wasn't remotely a believer and it was just awkward and weird and yeah, yeah, and everybody was all bummed. I'm like, just come to church, man. <laughs> all right. Uh, Jesus said this, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And what did he just say before that? I laid down my life for the one that I love. Yeah. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's 
friends. Jesus also says, I give them eternal life. And I think of that in the graphic that we showed yesterday on the screen, or excuse me, Sunday on the screen. I give them eternal life, and now I just picture that, that bit of eternity in me that is teaching me to lay down my life, to, to love others. And hopefully every time I lay down my life and I practice loving others, that eternity expands in my heart a little bit and I grow closer to God. Okay, uh, verses 19 and 20 are also kind of confusing verses from the Greek. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us for God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. You can almost tell the NIV guys had trouble translating that. In fact, I think what I did was I read it, I think I wrote it down verbatim. Oh yeah, I did. I, you want to hear verbatim from the Greek, what it says? Yeah. This is why they struggled with this. That if ever may be down knowing of us, the heart that greater is the God of the heart of us, and he is knowing all. <laughs> yeah um, um so uh, your translation might be different than what i just read because different translations have translated differently it appears as like even when we don't love accordingly the condemnation god knows our desire to do so okay so um in other words even that there is the downward knowing downward knowing is the condemning of us the heart the greater is the god of the heart knows us it's like saying god knows our hearts even when we sin does that make sense yeah um because there's this interesting word link between down knowing which is kata genoske and god knowing the genoske of us right and i would teach out of this this idea the concept on intent now we've talked about these this word of in the intention of your hearts over the years in this bible study it really came up a lot during um, the book of psalms because we were sort of struck by david who can at one hand say lord go get those sinners and show them no mercy and then be like oh have mercy on me, God, a sinner, right? You know? And what we kind of came up with was this idea of sort of the intent of the heart to move towards God versus, and it kind of fits tonight's teaching, versus that habitual sinning of turning from God and not even remotely thinking of God versus the believer who's, God knows the intent of our hearts. We desire to do good, like Paul says, my inner man, I, I desire to do good, but I often find that I cannot. Paul's intent of his heart, his driving force is towards God and righteousness. And then we can kind of begin to wrap up here. Verses 21 and uh, 22. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Okay, kind of a lot going on there. And it's kind of a summary of everything we've sort of talked about tonight and even summarizing where we are in the book. Um, it brings up an interesting concept. Have you ever heard the... Um, the, the quotation, um, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, yeah. and strength, and then do whatever you want. No. You never heard that before? Well, let me give you the, con well, okay, for, let me first explain to you. I, I went, I've heard that before, so I went and looked it up to see where it came from. Interestingly enough, it came from a sermon from St. Augustine, and the exact quote, I actually read the sermon today. It was pretty interesting. It was a sermon on love by Augustine, and this is the quote from the sermon, love God and do as you will. And the theory is this, so bear with me. The theory is, is this, if you truly love God, right? And if the desires of your heart are so entwined with God, then you will desire what God desires for you. 
And if you can reach that place, you technically get everything you want because everything that you want is what God already desires for you. And then if you really want to spiritualize it, that's why I had to sing, give me what tonight? Jesus. Because ultimately we get Christ. When, when we embrace him fully, right? Then everything else is just details and beyond, you know, after the fact, so to speak. And boy, I, I would feel like I would want to quote Paul to you right now saying, not that I have attained all this, because to even conceive of fully being, giving myself fully over to Christ seems like such a foreign idea to me, right? But remember what Paul said, not that I have attained to all this, but I press on seeking to grab a hold of that for which he has grabbed a hold of me. I'm pretty sure I got the verse right. Does that sound right? That was kind of right off the top of my head right there, but I think I got it right. Yeah, not that I have attained to all of this, but I press on seeking to grab a hold of that for which he has grabbed a hold of me. And then lastly, of course, he says, and what is the command? Believe. Believe, believe, believe. And if you believe, you'll love God and you'll love people. And I'm going to wrap up tonight a little bit early, um, but I, I want to just tell you briefly a quick story. And for, forgive me if I just told this story recently, but I can't remember. <laughs> but it happened real recently. It was, uh, it was when I went over for my son's graduation out of college. Did I tell this story? What had happened was one day after church, somebody had said, um, this is like four or five years ago when he was about 14, and we were standing next to each other, and somebody said, so, Cozy, are you a big surf guy like your dad? And he's not. <laughs> like, if you know my son, he doesn't even like the ocean. <laughs> he's not into surfing at all, right? When they have, they have shoreline down at the beach, he doesn't go in the water, right? He's not into it. And Cozy said, nope, I'm pretty much a disappointment to my father. And I was like, oh, gouge, you know? And he was being funny, like, ha, ha, ha. But obviously, like, I never forgot it. So we, we went out to lunch on Oahu about four or five weeks ago, his graduation. And I told him that story, and he didn't remember it. I said, do you remember what you said? No, I was disappointed to you. And he says, Dad, I don't even remember that. I was probably just joking around. I go, okay, okay, because I want to be real clear about something, right? You are the farthest thing from a disappointment to me. <laughs> I go, because you don't know this, but when you were about two or three years old and you were playing with Maddie Drake, Matt and I were talking about it. And we, we were talking about how our greatest desire for our sons wouldn't be that they would great, be great, awesome surfers. Because, and I hope you might have to edit this out, because to be perfectly honest with you, really red hot 14 year old surfers are usually a little <laughs> <laughs> They are. And I was one of them, you know. You think you're like, you know, oh, you're the t you're the baddest guy. And, and and around here and even back then, they're usually smoking weed every day, surfing every day, becoming little prideful degenerates. And so when I thought about you becoming a surfer, it was kind of like, yeah, maybe, you know. But I said this, this is what Matt and I talked about when you were about two years old. I said, you know what I really want, Matt, is two things. I want my son to have his own faith in God. And you know what I mean by that? Like, because you know, you're raised in a Christian household, whatever, but we all know what happens around 16, 17, 18, whatever, kids wobble. I want my kid to like pick up his own cross and carry it and have a faith that isn't dependent on me, but his own faith. And then I realized I was planning on having this talk with Cozy, two things. The first one is, Cozy seems to have both those things really well. He's a real likable, well-spoken. People tell me all the time, yeah, just your kid's awesome, man. He's a good kid. And he's really not <laughs> Furthermore, what other 16-year-old do you know that comes home and instead of like rap music playing at full volume in his car, he's listening to Bible Project podcast from Tim Mackey. And he's off to Cape and he seems to really be rooted in the Lord. But what I told Cozy was this, I go, you know, I was thinking about having this talk with you when it dawned on me. It, I'd never thought about it this way. But all those years ago, which he's 18, so that was 16 years ago, what I wanted for my son was the same thing God wants from all of this. Love God and love people, right? 
Let me just wrap up with this verse, and we've got a lot of time if anybody wants to add anything. Yeah, we finished a little early, but look what, look what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 30. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I've set before you, I love this, life and death, blessings and curses. In fact, based on tonight's, I can add love and hate, life and murder, right? And he says this, now choose life that you and your children might live, yeah? So anyways, so we're not to question our salvation because we sin on occasion, but it's conceptually, I don't need to, I, it, he says it 10 different times. I don't need to summarize it one last time. Does anybody have any questions or comments on any of this? Oh my gosh. Oh good, thank God, one comment or yeah, go ahead, Steve. It was probably two years ago when Darren was preaching, and I heard him just use one phrase that has been the most important phrase in my walk ever since. I love it. And, and all he said was, you know, we're Christians, and we're not sinless, but we do sin less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would, uh, you know, I, I, would like to, I would like to think that if you proclaim Christ as your Lord, and, you know, 30 years later, your life should look different. You know, your life should look different. Yeah. And it's okay to say that, you know, we don't like, yeah. I've said it 50 times tonight. I don't know if you caught what she said, if you could hear, but hang out with Mike and Susie Wellman. And it, can I use the word almost laughable, the small sins that they were worried about. And meanwhile, you had great big ones. <laughs> 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 Steph, Steph, you kind of worded it that way. I just, I just, I just had to say it. No, but it's really true. I mean, I remember, I remember, I had a, a major uh, mind shift. I, you might want to edit this out, Tom. But I'm thinking of just taking the editing the whole thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's kind of edit night. But I've and I've shared this with you guys a million times. But you know the story. When I quit smoking weed, I thought I had arrived. I thought that was like the biggest thing. Christians can't smoke weed. So you quit weed and then you're good. You're done. But what I discovered was loving people oh, is so hard. It is a lifelong endeavor of trying and failing and trying and failing and getting a little bit better at it and a little bit less self-centered and a little bit more out-centered and then getting selfish again and repenting and trying to be others, you know, other focused. That is the real battle, you know, quitting an addiction. Yeah, good for you. And that was just killing you anyways. Right. Yeah. Really? I mean, it is. I mean, really, like quitting alcohol or drugs. Well, you weren't, you know, probably likely weren't much, maybe hurting other people as much as just hurting yourself. That's not that big of an accomplishment if you're a Christian. The really big accomplishment is to love other people more than yourself. That is like where the rubber meets the road yeah i mean are you actually asking me how to do that i hate to say it but there's no easy way and it really comes through i mean if basically to answer your question i'd have to teach a course on how do you grow as a christian and there re i mean really and there really is just some fundamental basics and it's number one fellowship be in a community of believers yeah because, well, for number one, the word says to. I mean, it's a command. It's not, a, it's not an option. Uh, as Steve always has a wonderful way of putting it. I might get it wrong, Steve. But it is the only way you can sort of see yourself in the light of others. In other words, if you're out of fellowship, you only have yourself to compare yourself to. And you can't see the gaps and the needs and whatever. Plus, if you hang out in fellowship, we will offend you. And then you have to learn how to forgive. And I'm... I'm a little, I say that jokingly, but we all know it's super true. The other thing is to read the word. And that is the only way to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And it might mean reading your Bible physically every day, which is the best thing. But it also is another reason why you stay in fellowship. You need to sit under the teaching of the word by Bible preaching pastors and Bible preaching teachers, you know. And then, um, what's the other one? Uh, prayer, you know. Uh, and not just, you know, the quick Our Father or whatever, but the conviction of prayer to, to put your face in the carpet and ask for God's forgiveness and to receive communion on a regular basis, honestly, which brings up the idea of I am a sinner worthy of hell. Th those are like four major things. Oh, and then service would be the fifth thing, yeah? Service. 
which I'm going to wrap up because we're way over time right now. My apologies. We, we're four minutes over time right now. And so I'll wrap up with this idea because um, Donna, at her comment, said understanding the joy of service. And I just want to remind everybody, we'll need your uh, exercise that joy on Sunday to help us serve chili as you live out what you're learning on Tuesday nights by serving chili on Sunday. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this night. Thank you for your word. Uh, I can't, where do I even begin to say thank you, Lord, that you have loved us the way you do. And I use that in the perfect present tense, God. Um, we think about the love that we have for our children and to think that your love for us is even greater than that is kind of mind boggling, God. But you love us and you desire good for us. You desire life and eternal life for us, God. And so thank you, God, for bearing with us while we live it out so imperfectly, God. Um, but um, we, we seek to please you and also to uh, inhabit the life that you have for us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.